Sisters and brothers to Christ, we welcome you to worship this morning. In the name of Jesus Christ, whom we declare to be our Lord and Savior, we are part of Christ's body where everyone is loved and everyone belongs. Let us join together in our call to worship. God has accomplished all things together through Christ so that we might live as God's own children. Let us give thanks to God and live for the praise of God's glory. Come, let us worship the God of reconciliation. Please join in our prayer invocation. Eternal God, from the foundation of the world, you have set a plumb line to measure our lives so that we may live in truth. By the power of your Holy Spirit, Strengthen our hands for building justice and making peace through the righteousness of Christ. Amen. I invite you into a time of personal and corporate confession, depending on God's mercy to hear our prayers. Jesus loves us. He loves us with steadfast tenderness. Therefore, let us confess our sins to God. Please take this time for your personal prayers of confession. Please pray with me. Holy God, you call us to be your beloved children and to care for one another. Yet we fail to love others and ourselves. Helpless and ashamed, we turn our hearts to you. Forgive us and then tenderly teach us to stand strong and courageous in the fullness of your love by the grace and mercy of Christ. Amen. Sisters and brothers, God forgives us and strengthens us for love. Therefore, be at peace. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Now we have time for young disciples. If we have young disciples worshiping with us today, we're doing it anyway. Well, time for Young Disciples. We have some Young Disciples that are probably watching on television as we, as we pull the worship service out. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. <clears throat> Pastor Joe always closes our church worship service with the words, go in peace. That's not just a pretty saying. He means it. Now, he wasn't the first person to come up with those words. That's been used in the church as long as there's been people gathered together. And I suspect occasionally before the church was formed that people asked each other to go in peace. Because we have different groups, people have always separated themselves into different groups. And sometimes it's hard for those different groups to get along. God sent Jesus to teach us how to make that happen. It's always been hard because people, when they form themselves into different groups, sometimes they fight with each other. They divide themselves. In Jesus's day, it was the Jews against the Gentiles. You'll hear about that in our scripture reading this morning. But it's always been hard for people to get along. Different nations fight, sometimes go to war with each other. In our own country lately, if you've listened to the news, you know that the Republicans and the Democrats are not getting along so well together these days, or people who are vaccinated against people who are not vaccinated. There's always groups that set themselves opposed to each other. 
it isn't always big things or big people doing this either. When Pastor Joe says, go in peace, he means you too. Maybe you play on a team or maybe you just play with kids in your neighborhood. Sometimes you get into arguments, maybe at school or at the swimming pool. Your help is needed to help people go in peace. You're beginning to learn now as you grow up what Jesus taught us to do, how to bring people together. So go in peace. Don't shut anybody out. Don't cut anybody down. Look for ways to help people get along together. Love your enemies into friends. Go in peace. And remember that you don't go alone. God goes with you. And Jesus works in and through you. So go in peace. And the peace of Christ that is almost bigger than we can imagine or understand will go with you today and every day. Amen. Our first scripture reading this morning comes from Psalm 89, verses 20 through 37. Please join me responsibly. I have found my servant David. With my holy oil, I have anointed him. My hand shall always remain with him. My arm shall, shall strengthen him. The enemy shall not outwit him. The wicked shall not humble him. I will crush his foes before him and strike down those who hate him. My faithfulness and steadfast love shall be with him, and in my name his horn shall be exalted. I will set his hand on the sea and his right hand on the rivers. He shall cry to me, you are my father, my God, and the rock of my salvation. I will make him the firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. Forever I will keep my steadfast love for him, and my covenant with him will stand firm. I will establish his line forever, and his throne as long as the heavens endure. If his children forsake my law and do not walk according to my ordinances, if they violate my statutes and do not keep my commandments, then I will punish their transgression with a rod, and their iniquity with scourges. But I will not remove from him my steadfast love or be false to my faithfulness. I will not violate my covenant or alter the word that went forth from my lips. Once and for all, I have sworn by my holiness. I will not lie to a David. His line shall continue forever and his throne endure before me like the sun. It shall be established forever, like the moon, an enduring witness in the skies. Before I read our second scripture lesson this morning, I want us just to draw some attention as to what we started last week. If you remember reading in the book of Ephesians, and I hope some of you had taken the time this past week to read through from beginning to end the whole book of Confessions, and I, as I said, try to do it twice, the first time straight through, the second time with a pen or a pencil and underlining those things which kind of jump out at you. But from the, that first passage we looked at last week, it was this astounding piece of 
uh, just extraordinary, extraordinary promise that from the very foundations of the earth, God knew you and has brought you to this place today. This is, this is an amazing, an amazing promise. And it, it, it brings out from us the fact that we are not accidents. And didn't we just, we did just happen, but you are from the, the heart and the mind of God brought here to hear God's word so that what has been in the past now becomes alive and present in this time. We are called in our name, in our baptism, to come and be God's people in this time and in this place. And so we continue our journey through the book of Ephesians. And the sad part is, is that I have to leave out too much. But again, so they we're jumping already now into the second chapter. But I hope you have had the time to go and look at the parts that were left out to review and, and to try to uh, see how this, how Paul's letter kind of holds together. So reading from the second chapter, verses 11 through 22, again, I invite you to listen for the word of God that comes to you this day and in this place. So then, remember that at one time you Gentiles by birth called the uncircumcision by those who are called the circumcision, a physical circumcision made in the flesh by human hands. Remember that you were at that time without Christ, but aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace. In his flesh he had made both groups into one and broken down the dividing wall that is the hostility between us. He has abolished the law with his commandments and ordinances that he might create in himself one new humanity in a place of two, thus, thus making peace. And might reconcile both groups to God in one body through the cross, thus putting to death the hostility through it. So he came and he proclaimed peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him, both of us have access to the one spirit to the father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens but you are citizens with the saints and all the members of the household of God built up apostles and prophets for Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. In him, the whole structure is joined together and grows into a holy temple in the Lord in whom you also are built together spiritually into a dwelling place for God. Friends, this is the word of God. Thanks be to God. I invite you to pray with me. Holy Spirit, come and dwell in this place. Place Jesus Christ in us so that he is the cornerstone holding us together and making us a sacred place where steadfast love and faithfulness will meet, where righteousness and peace will kiss each other. 
And now, O oh Lord, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be holy and acceptable unto you, O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Two men met together on a spring morning. It was a usual, a usual meeting for these two that, that came each and every spring. And they met along the wall that separated one person's, one man's property from the other. This was a stone wall and during the during the winter months, with the freezing and the thawing, the freezing and the thawing, the, the rocks would fall away from the stone wall. And so one of the first things they had to do in the spring was to, to gather at the wall and walk along one on each side and to pick up the stones, some as small as baseballs, others maybe as large as a as, as, as a loaf of bread or even as a toaster to put back. And stone walls, if you've ever had the, the joy of trying to build a stone wall, it's an amazing skill because it takes a lot of patience to find the right balance to hold the rocks in place. Now, for some of you, you may know that this story or this narrative begins as the, as the background for one of the great American poems by Robert Frost, Mending Walls. And in that poem, with that narrative line, the neighbor to the speaker has this cliche that comes in. It says, good fences make good neighbors. And this is a rather folksy poem. I love Frost because he writes in such simple language with great imagery. But they just draw you in and say, what is behind the words? And in this story about mending walls, this poem, he really presents for us, well, it could be called the ambiguity of what a wall does or the certainty of a wall. Because the, this, this, this notion of good fences make good neighbors means to be saying that, gee, walls are, are a good thing, but yet the opening line of that poem says sometime, something there is that does not love a wall. So while a wall might make good neighbors, there's something in our interior that says that we don't really love walls. Now the tricky, the, the, the important part of this poem, the, the image in this poem is that this wall exists because now if you go to New England or especially if you find yourself walking across the moors in the UK where there's sheep and we saw them when we were in New Zealand, there's stone walls and sheep on one side and sheep on the other. And the walls were really important to keep one herd from another the same way that New England, they're often used to separate the milk cows. But Frost says in his poem, this wall that existed that they maintained every year was to protect on one side an apple orchard and on the other a stand of cedar trees. There were no cows to jump the wall to trespass from one pasture into another. And thus we see the, the ambiguity again or the uncertainty as, as to how walls can really function. Each time I, I'm so thankful that the second chapter of Ephesians is there because it asks and invites 
need us to think about walls in our lives. Hear this verse 14, verse, verse 14 again, for he, that is Christ, is our peace. In his flesh, he has made both groups into one and has broken down the dividing wall. That is the hostility between us. But this is not just an invitation to look at the exterior walls that are part of our, our world, but also the interior walls that are inside and even define us. So let's take a moment and look at some of those exterior walls. The walls, in, in this case, that are that of the source of hostility or a result of hostility. I think one element of, of, of walls is that it creates a certain illusion of security. It's things that we can build a defense kind of props us up against some of our fears. The Chinese, I mean, we now have a great, one of the great wonders of the world was this, the Great Wall of China. Marvelous. It was built so it would keep the marauding people to the north so that they wouldn't come in and attack. Well, it worked for a while, and then it didn't. There's a wall, the crumbling pieces of a wall left between the, in the northern part of England that separates England from Scotland. You know, that Hadrian's Wall is there, it was built by the, the Romans so that they would, they would keep those heathen, crazy Scots on the other side of the wall so that the good British Anglo-Saxons or the Romans and all of their culture, you know, could continue to do their Pax Romana as they oppress the people. All we see now are the rubbles, the rubble of Adrian's Wall. After the First World War, the French invested millions and millions of francs and built a marginal line, a marginal wall that, that to, to protect themselves so that Germany never again will be able to invade France in the way they did setting up that trench warfare of the First World War, that horrible, horrible experience. And that worked until the German generals, under the guidance of Adolf Hitler, figured that there was a way around the wall and it just went through Belgium and they were able to break through that wall and it made nothing more than a laugh. You see, we have built walls and we continue, we could have a, a heated discussion today about the, the millions of dollars, the billions of dollars that we've used to separate ourselves from the invading hordes that come out from towards from Mexico and from Central and further South America. We have spent much to build our walls and yet all we seem to do is reinforce a spirit of hostility rather than find security. These interior, these, these exterior walls, I believe, are really rooted in the interior walls that we have within us that I'm, I'm not even sure we're aware of. I don't think I constructed them. They, they seem to have been in my DNA. We could talk about that in terms of, of, of how we are biologically determined so that we have a fear of the other, the one who is not like us, so that we know that our security is based upon the clan, the, the family, that we can hold ourselves together with some, you know, that this is who we can depend upon. And so somewhere in our very base of human survival, we, we think about being, keeping the other at a distance. That interior wall that needs to be 
elevated as we as we move beyond the, the 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 family and we begin to have communities and communities share their corporate fear and we built all of these things to destroy community we could look today at the scourge of racism as we have found ways to use use to distinguish ourselves from the other and to build a wall. And I'm not even sure that anybody taught us, but then that's not true either. I can remember the stories I was told about those people are happy living over there so that we can be happy over here. That's just the way people stay happy. These exterior walls, walls, these interior walls, they continue to find us not free in our lives, but like this, holding to ourselves. And now we have this crazy notion. You think it's crazy notion about we were God intended for us to be here this morning from the very foundations of the earth. He's also talking about that in Christ, there is a new humanity. Oh my gosh, what a pipe dream. How foolish, where's the history of that truth. Let's take a little bit of it, let's take a step back and, and see to who this letter that Paul was writing was addressed to. And, 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 and Susan alluded to the fact that this congregation was made up of Jews and Gentiles, probably more than likely founded by Jews. Uh, they were the ones who had the anniversary celebrations because they've been around a long time. And they knew what it meant to be religious. And they adjusted their, their Jewish heritage. You know, they adjusted it to, to allow Jesus to become a centerpiece that they saw in these Jewish Christians. They, they saw in Jesus of Nazareth, the Messiah. And they understood the power of the covenant. Of, and, and, and Christ was this, the symbol of the notion of this covenant being reaffirmed from all the history of ancient Israel. And so there, was, there were those who were Gentiles, those who were, as he says, far off. You know, there's something about it. I, I remember watching Sesame Street when I... I didn't have anything else to do with kids, right? You know, and, and I remember Grover, I think it was Grover. Anyway, he was trying to teach the kids far and near. And of course, he would start running far away. He got small. And then he would run up, and he got bigger, and he was near. And he did this three or four times. I was exhausted watching him. But I remember the one thing that that which is far off, optically, in our, in our, from our eyes, how we see things, it becomes smaller. It's a diminishing as we keep another at a distance. And, and, it, and what, what, what was felt, there was, a, there was a tension in this young church's Ephesus between these what we call Jewish Christians and the Gentile Christians. And, and Paul is trying to say that, that these walls of hostility, the difference between the two, because, hey, the Jews had it all together. They were the covenant people. They had been around for a long time. They knew how to do religion. And the Gentiles were just angry. And they didn't feel like they fit in, but they wanted to fight. They wanted to get in. They wanted to be able to be. And what, what they neither one understood, that God was doing something different in Christ in the formation of community. He says, the covenant I made about you are my people, 
and I am your God was not just spoken to the Israelites alone, but it was spoken to humanity from the very beginning of creation when God breathed breath into that first human being. And Christ is the new affirmation of that. Now let's be honest and know about the actuality of the walls that divide us. We are, we need the courage. As, the, as, as Paul was asking them to say, okay, Gentiles, you remember where you were far off and you, you Israelite family over here, you know that you got this all together, but you know, neither of those positions are gonna bring you together as peace, shalom, shalom is well-being, will not bring you into the community. Talk about these walls have been broken down now. We don't always, I started out with a poetry lesson, now we get to a grammar lesson, but we all know this. It says, the walls of hostility, these host walls that create hostility have been broken down. That's called past tense. I think it's even called past perfect, but I could be in trouble with that. I got an English teacher. I'm married to an English teacher. She said, yeah, it has been done. So what are these silly walls that we keep running our heads into? And it creates this uptight. This is uptight. Well, they are of our sin. They are indications of our brokenness. They are a result that we like to keep some people far off because they're coming too close. They ask me to be different than I already am and I need to have to find a different way of forming community. What this has to do for a congregation in the 21st century is that the walls of hostility that we hold on to, that we're even, whether we're aware of it or not, interrupt our ability to be disciples of Jesus Christ. The reason we struggle as a congregation, as a, as a denomination, is, is, is that we, we, we have to show that it's worth the effort to break down a wall. Now, there are a couple of ways to tackle walls. One is the billy goat method. You know, there's the wall, here's my head. Boom, and boom, and boom. And usually it's a headache. But there is another way because Laz, with that stone wall that separates these two farmers, a wall is made up of different sized stones. And you can reach in and you could take one stone out. The cool thing is, I remember the whole thing about the balance. You could take that little stone out and the big stone above it is crushed. It falls down, the hole in the wall can appear much faster than we believe, but we have to be willing to risk the moving of the small stone. Now, the funny thing is that congregations are often have somebody in the church, in the congregation that remembers, oh, this was a good thing at one time. And, and so maybe I'm gonna take that little stone and I'm gonna put it back in there so that we can have that security that we need about looking at the present and into the future. But now, see that there's heaving in the winter. See, change is that heaving of the seasons and it will disrupt that wall. And whether we're going to be part of the wall that is disrupting our time and our place, it's really gonna be up to us as a church, as individual congregations, even as a denomination. Because the reality, friends, is the dividing walls have been broken down in Christ. This is the spiritual reality 
of what Christ means coming into this world. We are a new humanity, whether we have the eyes to see it or the courage to act on it, it does not determine God's intention and what God is going to do with us or without us. Body of Christ discerned its demands of its disciples to come forward and be the instruments of peace, the instruments of reconciliation, of crossing the boundaries. And then the courage to say, thank you, God. Thank you. For I am realizing the new humanity. I love Ephesians because it still can teach us today about what it means to be a church. And that's good news. Let us take a few moments in silent reflection as we reflect on God's word for us today. As we come to God's in prayer this morning, I, are there prayer requests that people have? Yes. Thank you, Randy. I think this is, you know, the serendipity.
We come to the Lord's table this morning knowing that God has been generous to us. And so in response to God's generosity, we also make our own offerings and the, be an offering plate at the rear of the church as we exit this morning. Let our gifts be to, to the glory of God. So friends here, this is the table that where Christ is our host. And men and women will come from the east and the west, the north and the south to come and sit at this table. For it is here we don't see walls. Here we see the new humanity in Christ shared so that each can come and be fed in body and in spirit. So come, this table has been prepared for you. Please join with me in prayer. From the very beginning, O oh God, you created this earth and the heavens and beyond our imaginations into whatever space and time there is. You have brought us to this place so that we can offer thanksgiving for this grace that we receive in the wonder of diversity and beauty. Eternal God, we give you thanks for your son, Jesus Christ, who broke down these walls of hostility and calls us into a, a redemptive life of living beyond our fears and beyond our prejudices. And for your spirit, O oh God, that holds us together, that pushes us out as we use the, the love that you have given us for the service of others. Loving God, we give you thanks for the fruit of the earth and the fruit of the vine, and may they be for us this morning, a sign and the seal of the covenant you made with us from the very beginning, the covenant of steadfast love and generosity. We offer this prayer in the name of Jesus the Christ, for we pray in his name. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Eat it in remembrance of me. In the same way that he gathered his disciples at the Sea of Galilee, the resurrected Lord came and ate with those disciples. And he said to them, feed my sheep as I have fed you. In the same way, he took the cup after supper, he poured it out and he said, this is the new covenant in my blood. Poured out for the forgiveness of sin. Drink ye all of it in remembrance of me. As often as we eat of this bread and we drink of this cup, we declare the glory of the Lord until he comes and reigns eternally. I invite you to take a moment of silence as you prepare to receive these gifts from God. We'll have two serving places this morning. I invite you to come down the center aisle, receive and go out. Friends, come forward. This is the table of the Lord, which is prepared for you. This is the food of God for God's holy people. So come, feast and know that the Lord is good.
feast and know your peace that comes as we receive your body and your life in this juice. Eternal and loving God, send us forth with thanksgiving and showing your grace. For we pray it in Christ's holy name. Amen. Thank you. 